All right, welcome, welcome, everybody. This is the third hour of power. This is Grady of This Mormon Life, and with me this week is my dad, Glenn Kerr. Welcome, Dad. Hello, Grady, my favorite son. Yes, it is now archived on the Internet. Everyone will know that I am the favorite. You are. Yes. <laughs> so when I first started this podcast, you know, I've, I've kind of recruited some of my friends and family to be guest hosts. If you are not a friend or family and want to be a guest host, uh, feel free to email me at Grady at this-mormon-life.com. But if you are a friend or family, that works too. But Dad said, you know, you're going to be doing this podcast. I want to be on Lesson 17 because uh, – oh, tell us, tell, tell us that story, Dad. Well, 17 is a lesson that I am going to be teaching in a few weeks in our uh, high priest quorum, our high priest group. You know, our policy is that everybody gets a chance to teach. So I thought, well, you know, I'm going to get an assignment to teach. I'd rather pick a topic and teach what I want to teach. So about six months ago, I volunteered for Chapter 17, Sealing Power and Temple Blessings. So I figured I've got about six months to get ready, and this is a good primer. Yeah, and now your day of reckoning is at hand. It is. All right, and you did a great job. You introduced the lesson for me, so I appreciate that. And mm -hmm. why don't you go ahead and take the first point for us? I think that the, uh, the very first paragraph pretty much sums up the whole lesson. It says, Elijah came to restore to the earth the fullness of the power of the priesthood. This priesthood holds the keys of binding and sealing on earth and in heaven of all the ordinances and principles pertaining to salvation of man. Good. Why did you pick that paragraph? Many people look at uh, the reason Elijah came and think, well, okay, he came to restore the binding of earth and in heaven or the sealing ordinances. But he came with a lot more than that. He came and brought the fullness of the gospel. He brought every power, every ordinance, every everything that the priesthood has. Oracles, ordinances, revelations, powers, endowments. He brought the fullness and complete power of the Melchizedek priesthood and gave it to man on earth, namely Joseph Smith. Yeah, and I like that you say about authority. A lot of times we think about the sealing power as simply as the power to seal families, which is part of it. But part of the sealing power is the authority <clears throat> to be the mouthpiece of God on earth. Um, we see it, we just read about Elijah in our Sunday school lessons, where Elijah was given the sealing power to do things on earth as if Heavenly Father were there, to basically speak as his voice. We see it again in the Book of Mormon when Nephi seals the heavens and it doesn't rain. And it says in, uh, in the Old Testament, it says that Elijah is quoting himself saying, but by my word will it rain again. And he's basically putting himself as a, uh, as a placeholder for Heavenly Father. He's saying, I have the authority to act as he would act and to say what he would say. And whatever I pronounce as God's will, that is what it is because we are so in sync and for Joseph Smith, that was that power and authority that was restored. I think it's pretty amazing. Elijah had the power to move mountains, to stop the rains, to do anything. He had the power over, like you said, the same exact power that our father Nevin had over the earth. Yeah, in the second section here, uh, it talks more about that sealing power. And specifically, he talks about the sealing power. And it says here in section two, if the sealing power were not on the earth, then confusion would reign, and disorder would take, take place of order in that day when the Lord shall come. And of course, this could not be, for all things are governed and controlled by perfect law in the kingdom of God. And I, I read this phrase, I had a hard time understanding why it is that the sealing power would create such chaos uh, in the world. And one of the things that I was thinking about with this was the idea that not only is the sealing power a eternal uh, promise, but it is an earthly promise. Last week we talked about, or two weeks ago, we talked about eternal marriage and the idea that an eternal marriage is a godlike marriage and that that marriage isn't just a, an end goal that one day we'll be married forever, but that it, this life can be a place for us to have any celestial or heavenly marriage relationship. And I think it's the same way with the sealing is that we are sealed to those that we love in our hearts. You know, the relationship that I have with you, Dad, I think is stronger because of our sealing that was performed. That's right. I'll be your dad and you'll always be my son. That's right. 
<laughs> and so and so I got to make sure that I have a good relationship with you because I'm stuck with you. That's right. And I'm glad of it, too. You Me know, too. It's interesting to note that the um, the ceiling power is more than just the ceiling power to be able to bind on heaven and on earth and to bind marriages and families together. It is the crowning glory of the gospel. Without this ceiling power, everything that is done before that, conversion, baptisms, um, confirmation of the church, will mean nothing without that ceiling power. The ceiling power of being able to bind families together forever is like the catalyst that holds the entire church and the entire world and eternities together. Yeah, I, it's, it's amazing just how planned out our Heavenly Father is with this authority that he's given us with the priesthood. And that, you know, like in Scripture say that no man takes it on to himself. It's something that's done in order and uh, in a way that makes sense. And that's why it's neat that Elijah was the one that brought it back because he is one of the last prophets that uh, we associate that with. Although I'm sure other prophets had that authority, uh, he's one that we associate with that. And so it's symbolic in a way when he comes to restore that because, of course, Jesus Christ could have came and restored it himself. And, but instead of doing everything himself, he sends authorized representatives to act on his behalf. And it's a pattern that we emulate as priesthood holders. And even as those serving in callings and responsibilities, we act as Jesus would. And it's just neat that this has always been his defined pattern of authority and getting his work accomplished. Yeah, it's amazing how he uh, can it all planned out, huh? <laughs> what was your next point that you had? Oh, um, you know, I want to tell a little bit of story about genealogy. And, um, you know, at the very beginning of the lesson, there's a story about uh, President Smith telling a, uh, one of his friends that, that he knew about genealogy work, and he was going to tell him why we did it, and the guy was going to laugh at him. And anyway, one of the stories that are personal that I think is kind of interesting, uh, some years ago in our stake, we had a Everybody was excited about going to the temple for a steak day in the temple. And uh, me too, I was excited also. I had a number of friends who were not members of the church, and several of them had members of their families who had passed away. And I thought, you know what? They should have those blessings as well. So I went to my friend Doc. Uh, Doc's a dentist, and we've always called him Doc. His real name is Randy, but we call him Doc. And he had two children who passed away. One passed away just after birth which obviously because she or he was born or, and passed away before age of eight, temple ordinances are not required for him, but he had a daughter who passed away at eight after a, uh, an illness. And so I went to uh, my friend Doc and explained the, uh, the temple to him and the ordinances, and I know he really didn't quite understand, but he goes, yeah, okay, you can do that. So I got her information and we went to the temple for her. But when I was asking him the information, I thought, well, you know what? He had his dad passed away. So I said, hey, what about your dad? He says, oh, yeah, let's do him too. And I thought, well, that's pretty cool. So we uh, took the information for his dad and went to the temple for his dad. And while I'm there, I'm asking him, well, what about grandma? Grandma died. Oh, no, not grandma. She was a mean woman. She can wait. <laughs> Well, and, and I think you bring that up, the idea of waiting is that there are people who are, are waiting for us uh, to do this work. And I think that work for the temple is such a good, uh, I don't want to say missionary tool, because it's not a missionary tool, but it's a way to share the light of the gospel. It, it was neat. Our fifth Sunday lesson this week was from Elder Bednar's presentation that he did for Education Week, talking about using social media for good. And kind of the main theme or the main hashtag that they're trying to revolve around this is the idea of shared goodness. And it was neat because he gave this, like, I think it was like a 45-minute presentation about social media and the way we can use it to share goodness. And never once did he say, this is a tool for baptism. This is a tool for conversion. But more, he said, this is a way that we can share the light of the gospel in our lives with others and help them to feel that light. And I think that's something that, that you did for, for Doc when you were saying, this is something that they can bless her. Yeah, and it's also important to remember that as we share the gospel with others, it's not our job to convert them or get them into the, the baptismal font. Our job is just merely to share the gospel, and it's the job of the Holy Ghost to convert them, to bring them under as the Savior. And it's neat, this work, the way it's uh, <clears throat> ramping up and escalating. It's neat. Some of these pictures in the manual, you'll see this one that I'm looking at, 
and it's a picture of the kids at the computer and like mom and dad over hovering, hovering over their shoulders watching because it's come to this point in our time where technology is is helping us to hasten the work of of salvation not only on earth but also in the spirit world there are so many tools now online that help us to find our kindred dead those who have passed on who never had the opportunity to share the gospel and i hope that those of you that are instructors know your class know who's there and so that if there are those who have different levels of understanding um that we didn't really go into it in this in this segment but just the idea that what why we do temple work why it's a, be- a blessing to those who have passed on um if you got people in your class that are newer to the church that's a great thing to focus on because it really shares with us the mercy of our heavenly father the idea that he is not an umpire trying to strike us out the second he can but that he gives us opportunity on opportunity to repent and to change our hearts and to have these blessings of of the, the atonement and of salvation and i think it's a reminder of us in this life that even those who pass on are given a chance but that in this life, we are still given continual chance upon chance to change our hearts and to choose the right. Yeah, it's one of the great things about the gospel is um, you, you got until you die to get your life in order. And then even then, I think you're still going to have an opportunity because uh, it takes some of us longer to get it than others. And we, we need all those chances. And, it, you know, Heavenly Father wants us to be with him more than we want to be with him. And he's going to do everything he can to make sure that we make it there. In section five, it kind of talks about how to change our hearts mm-hmm. a little bit through family history work. It says, There is no work connected with the gospel that is of a more unselfish nature than the work uh, in the house of the Lord for our dead. Those who work for the dead do not expect to receive any earthly remuneration or reward. It is above all a work of love which is begotten in the heart of a man through faithful and constant labor in these saving ordinances. There are no financial returns, but there shall be a great joy in heaven with those souls whom we have helped to their salvation. When we go to the temple, I love it. That's that's one of those things that we've already made those commitments and those covenants. When we go to the temple, we go there now to help someone else make that same covenant. And we don't know who they are most of the time. Um, Sometimes we go, we're just given a name of some person we've never heard of. And the only connection we can find is Maybe that they were born in 1742 in Spain, and you're like, oh, neat, that's a fun fact. But when we go to the temple with names that we've found on our own, people that maybe we either knew in this life or knew how we're related to them, it makes us the experience at the temple so much more meaningful. That's a good point. You know, when we're going for somebody that we know or somebody that's a relative, it uh, puts a personal touch on it. But one of the nice things about uh, the temple is you don't always have to be there uh, doing temple work for other people. You could be there as a temple worker. It's one of the few callings or jobs in the church you can actually volunteer for. And um, it's a great, great blessing to be able to be in the temple and, and seeing those ordinances as you spend your day or your half a day, your hour, or whatever you spend there over and over again. You get very familiar with them. And also you get to participate in that sweet spirit uh, for your whole shift that you happen to be there. We worked in the uh, Los Angeles temple. Uh, Terry was a uh, greatest mom. I don't know what she did. <laughs> she helped people, I guess. <laughs> she told she told me she was like a runner. She would like, she would get the bag of temple names and take them to where they would go Yeah, and pass notes around. That's what, she was a runner. She was a uh, secretary. Yes, yeah, she was. Okay. I got to be a veil worker. It was a very spiritual experience every time that we went uh, to be able to help people through the veil. And the rewards and the stories that you hear in a temple, things that happen are just, uh, you have to kind of be there to experience it. It's hard to explain. Yeah. And they're all often sacred experiences that maybe don't always share in such a public form anyways, but they are real and they do happen. I've never gone to the temple and regretted it. I've never gone and said, oh, I should have just stayed home today. I say that. And when I was in traffic on my way, my way to the temple, <laughs> when I realized I wasn't going to make my session, I would say that. But the second I walked in the doors, gave them that big old smile, and I say, I missed my session. And they go, initiatories? And off <laughs> I go. And I would do my service to, to the Lord, and I would serve those who had passed on, and I would leave knowing that I had done something good. And and I would just, you know, my whole, my whole outlook had changed from who I was when I walked in those doors to who I was and I walked out was completely different. 
and also the blessings that come. I can share a little story about, you mentioned on the way to the temple, well, from Orange County to the Los Angeles Temple on the 405 freeway at about two in the afternoon could be a daunting task. Mm. Bumper to bumper, can't change lanes. You get stuck in a lane, it could be miles before you can get over. And it just used to drive me up the wall to have to deal with that. And uh, one time we were going to the temple and it was exceptionally bad. I mean, and I had to get over three lanes to be able to uh, get the off ramp. And I'm stressing over it and stressing over it. All of a sudden, the sea parted. I had three lanes of clear. I could easily and safely change the lanes. And, um, you know, I'm convinced it was Father in Heaven listening to my frustrations and helping me out to get off that freeway. Yeah, to make sure you walked in those doors in the right frame of mind to be able to serve. Indeed. Maybe even make it on time. Indeed. <laughs> well, great. Or is there any last things you wanted to add to this lesson before we wrap it up? No, I can't think of too much other than the fact that the uh, of, of the the blessings of sealing in the temple are the pinnacle of the gospel. Everything before that, everything after that means nothing without that sealing power. Amen to that. Well, to close, I want to thank you guys for listening again this week. We are back on schedule, back on track. I had some comments of people that are saying, I really want to listen, but I already had that lesson. And so we fixed the issue. I'm settled. I'm in my office now, as you can see. Our guest bed, if you ever come to Gilbert, you can come visit and stay with us if I know who you are. Um, and uh, my wife's craft table. We're getting, we're getting settled here. It's really nice. I shared a picture on Instagram tonight of just uh, a member of our ward came and dropped off brownies. And that's when we really knew that we had arrived. So to find out more about what we do here at the Third Hour of Power, you can visit www.this-mormon-life.com. That's where you can read about what I do on the internet. Also, our benefactors who are This Week in Mormons, they do a podcast where they talk about current news in the church. They also talk about the upcoming Sunday School lessons in their podcast, Sunday School Bonanza. It's the same format as ours, but awesome as well. So check that out. It's over at thisweekinmormons.com. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, if you search on those places, This Mormon Life, you will find us. And until next time, on behalf of my dad, Glenn, I bid you all a fond adieu. Thank you for having me on, Grady. It's been a real pleasure.